Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Digital Fridays event for this week. Um, my name is Sean. I'm one of the co-directors of Haystack Scholars. Um, welcome to today's event, which is called Divided Union, Digital Methods with Monuments, Statues, Politics, and Space. Um, I'm going to introduce the um, two people leading our event today in a second. But I just thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking a little bit about Digital Fridays and Haystack. So, you know, just to orient us to um, what is happening here. Um, so Digital Fridays is a, a speaker series event that we host here at Haystack Scholars. Um, the events are entirely led by scholars. They're proposed and led by scholars and there's a wide range of topics that we talk about. So we actually have events coming up every Friday from now until mid-May. Um, so I encourage you to come back and check in with us too for our future events. Um, Haystack. Haystack is, um, I'm sorry. Haystack is the Humanities, Arts, Science, and Technology Alliance and Collaboratory. We're an interdisciplinary community of humanists, artists, social scientists, scientists, and technologists, changing the way we teach and learn. Our 18,000 plus members are from over 400 affiliate organizations, and we share ideas news, tools, research, insights, pedagogy, methods, and projects, including digital humanities and other born digital scholarship, and collaborate on various Haystack initiatives like Digital Fridays. Um, welcome today. Um, so today we're being led by um, Laura Brennan and Janine Hubai. Um, Laura is a PhD student in the history and art history department at George Mason University and a digital history fellow at Roy Reisenwig Center for History and New Media. She's also a Haystack Scholar. She received her master's in women's, genders and sexuality studies at Georgia State University in 2019. Her research lies within feminist theory, indigenous studies, black and African-American studies. And she is particularly interested in concepts surrounding race and gender, power, memory, and space and resistance and freedom. Janine Hubai is a PhD student at George Mason University and a current Haystack Scholar. She received her MA in history at UMass Boston. Her research interests include race and ethnic relations, American Indian history and settler colonialism, military history, civil military relations, digital history and public history. Her current research focuses on the relations between Dine Navajo and the US military in the second half of the 19th century. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to them to lead us through the rest of our event today. Thank you so much for joining us. And... Thanks so much. Um, I'm Laura Brannon, and I'm going to begin the conversation and the presentation, and then Janine is going to finish after me. Um, so I'm going to share my screen to get started. But thank you, everyone, for being here. We're really excited to um, talk about our project with you all. Okay, can folks see my screen? Okay, thanks. So as most of us know, the protest of from the summer of 2020 in the US in response to George Floyd's death at the hands of police were foundational in shaping the way we, we viewed the pandemic, race, American history, and the way the US fits into this world of current racial inequity. My colleague Janine and I were in discussion over the summer about how we were both moved by the protests and we distinctly felt like so many other academics and digital humanists at the time might have felt like that we could contribute to the racial reckoning through using our archival research and digital skills. As scholars of race in American history, we knew all too well that these racial violences and particularly state violence against people of color in the US have been systemic and pervasive throughout American history. In short, we knew that this past continued into the present and actually continues to do so today in 2021, as we're all too aware of. So Janine asked Dr. Spencer Crew former director of the National Museum of African American History and Culture and professor at George Mason University, we, where we are both doctoral students. Um, she asked him to lead a directed readings class to discuss and contextualize the current racial 
moment in a public history course. So we began the course um, in the fall of 2020, and we started by just reading historical literature about race, memory, and in, in the public in the U.S., from the history of the North's complicity to slavery in the U.S., to the Reconstruction era, to the Jim Crow era in, in the U.S. And while reading these academic scholarly pieces, we also read roughly around 100 newspaper articles that tracked the different protests around the country and the world at the time over from the summer and into the fall. And so we were from these articles tracking the different institutional histories that have been questioned in light of the racial reckoning, the different Confederate statues being pulled down or protested about um, or graffitied in the US and all the different name changes that were taking place in, in school names, sports names, every, every street names, all of the above. And so from this work of contemporary and historical sources, we both chose individual subjects to study. Um, Janine focused on Grant's legacy and Confederate military bases, which she'll speak on in a few moments, um, while I focused on Richmond, Virginia. And all our work culminated in this website you see here called Divided Union, American Heroes and Racial Reckoning. And um, feel free to explore this website. I'm sure we'll share it in the chat. Um, this is our homepage and it's made in the platform WordPress. This um, landing image is a word cloud that represents the different words used in our collective research papers um, from our, that was the final product of our class of Dr. Crew, but then we also um, put into this website. Um, Janine has a more public facing part project about Grant's legacy and Confederate bases, while mine is a more part of my academic paper. Um, that's a part of my project on Richmond. Um, and this word cloud, as you can see, the bigger words represent the most used words in our papers. So Confederate, Monument, Avenue, Grant, Americans, all are kind of some tastes of our individual projects. Um, and then below here, on still on the main landing page, we have um, a brief introduction and then some images and photographs of primary sources we use throughout our individual projects, which you'll also get to see us dive a little more in detail about that. So my project was called Statues in Residential Space and was inspired by one of the major hubs of protest in the US last summer of 2020 um, in Richmond, Virginia. And so by tracking the different protests over last summer, I was struck by this case in Richmond um, and particularly it's notorious Monument Avenue, which is um, a street that had five Confederate statues placed within a mile of each other. And so this past summer, um, Jefferson Davis's statue, who was the president of the Confederacy, was removed by protesters. And later on in the summer, three other Confederate statues were removed by the mayor of Richmond in response to protests. And by the fall, and still to this day, actually, Robert E. Lee's statue is the only Confederate one remaining. Um, and his statue is seen here. This is a photograph. Um, in the early 20th century when it was put up. And then this was photo was taken last November. So this is kind of what he looks like in modern day. Um, and his, his existence, the statue's existence is still being debated about in court today. Richmond was right down the road from us. Um, George Mason is in Fairfax, Virginia, and was also one of the only instances I found where Confederate statues were part of a residential area. Most other Confederate statues in the US um, that have, were contested over the summer were on the grounds of government buildings or near local city halls or in a really public kind of tourist space, but none I had found were in an actual neighborhood by people's houses and where they lived and walked around. So thanks to a number of online exhibits created um, kind of in response to these protests and actually former protests in 2015, um, some being the American Civil War Museum, the Valentine Museum, and the Library of Virginia. Um, I 
realize that all these statues in Monument Avenue um, have been protested and questioned since its origins, beginning with Robert E. Lee's statue in 1890. And historically, Richmond was the, cap the capital of the Confederacy. So after the Civil War, the city was on the national stage in a way. Many people wanted to know if the South would recover from losing the Civil War and look to Richmond for their answer. Richmond sought to improve their city's image after the Civil War by first making economic moves to recover um, from the financial devastation after the war. By 1876, however, President Grant left office and federal intervention left from the South, which gave racial discrimination and violence free reign across the Southeast and across the country. Richmond also began to symbolically reassert itself as a powerful city and region by culturally and politically promoting the lost cause narrative. The idea that the Confederacy was a valiant military effort in the Civil War itself was based on battles over states' rights instead of slavery. The North, in part wanting the nation to recover economically at whatever cost, accepted this lost cause narrative easily through um, economic relationships with the South and by consuming different cultural media, media forms that have this narrative embedded in it. So this cultural and sectional reunion was perhaps most powerfully seen in the large scale fundraising, building and placement of Confederate statues across the entire country of the US. And Richmond's placement of the statue of Robert E. Lee, who was a general uh, of the Confederate Army, is a really also powerful and specific case study that I'm further exploring um, through di digital means and archival research. And though Robert E. Lee's statue was initially a cultural symbol and um, move to promote the lost cause narrative of the South, it was also intentionally a catalyst for the city to develop a successful boulevard that would later expand into a wealthy subdivision in Richmond. So Lee's statue over time helped Monument Avenue be a city planning financial success because the elite business class lived and built on the avenue, especially providing the city with a new wealthy subdivision. The avenue was also a financial success because it was seen as a, there we go. It was seen as a grand European style boulevard by the 20th century, which is part of the greater American Renaissance period of the late 19th century, where cities attempted to mimic European streets like Vienna's Ringstrasse by implementing tree-lined boulevards. Um, so this photo here is um, reminiscent of this kind of European style boulevard with the, the trees lining the median. Um, and this is a photo of Monument Avenue, but other examples of these kind of streets in the US are New York City's Fifth Avenue and Cleveland's Euclid Avenue. Richmond resident and novelist Ellen Glasgow published a book in 1916 that described a scene where a Richmonder takes others for a drive on Monument Avenue, exclaiming, here are the monuments. You don't see many streets finer than this in New York, do you? So building from this idea in this historiography of Richmond, and um, the reconstruction era that kind of bleeds into the lost cause narrative with the Jim Crow era, I formed two research questions. One, what were the relationships between the early residents of Monument Avenue and these Confederate statues? And two, since the avenue was a city planning initiative, did the statues give cultural value to the avenue in the greater neighborhood? To answer these questions, I used data from Sarah Shield Driggs, Richard Guy Wilson, and R Robert Winthrop's book, Richmond's Monument Avenue, which provided the address date, original owner, and the architect of the first 300 houses and apartment buildings built on Monument Avenue between the years 1894 to 1960. This was an appendix in their book, um, and thanks to Hathi Trust, which some of y'all might know in academia, um, it's an open access digitized repository that emerged due to the rising need of academic access during COVID-19. Um, I was able to access this appendix easily. And I transcribed it and created a data set seen here. 
using their appendix about the buildings on Monument Avenue, which I then used the software programming language called R to filter out Richmond's Confederate statues from the Southern Poverty Law Center's Who's Heritage Project, which is a whole data set of all of the Confederate statues known to be in the US over time. Um, so I combined, I combined that data and of just Richmond's Confederate statues with this data of all the houses and buildings on Monument Avenue. And through that curated this data set, which I then plugged into ArcGIS story maps. And I would, from there, I was able to map out manipulate the data to show each building and statue by the years they were placed on the avenue in order to understand if there was a connection between when the statues were placed and when the houses were built on the avenue. And from that is this map here. And so this is on our website as, as a part of my project, but it's a part of the larger website. Um, and this is the housing map of Monument Ave Avenue showing the chronology of homes and statues. So these smaller points, these purple points are representative of a house or apartment complex. And this legend here shows the lighter color it is means the earlier it was built and the darker purple means the later it was built. And um, these blue little pins here represent um, Confederate statues in Richmond. And so if you zoom out for a moment, I've actually mapped all the Confederate statues in Richmond for further exploration. So this is kind of by the Virginia Commonwealth University and other areas of the city. But for our purposes, I'm obviously focused on mm -hmm. this street. And so as you can see, the blue markers represent um, a Confederate statue and the 1891 is Robert E. Lee's, the one I was speaking about earlier. And actually, for the most part, after Robert E. Lee, the other Confederate statues, Jefferson Davis and others, are placed about 10 years or so after. And they're chronologically placed west along the avenue. And you'll notice, especially if I zoom out, by 1890, Robert E. Lee's statue, there's lighter points generally around here. And if you go west along the avenue, there's generally darker purple points up here. Um, so it seems through mapping this that there's a general pattern of houses built west along the avenue as Confederate monuments were placed west along the avenue. And so this map alongside other sources, such as the fictional book I referenced earlier that was written by a resident of the street and newspaper real estate advertisements explicitly promoting the opportunity to live near the statues all support my argument that the statues gave Monument Avenue financial and cultural value to residents and builders. And this newspaper advertisement, I think, is just really powerful. Um, it says, in the very shadow of Lee Monument, you can buy Monument Annex lots, richest of investments. So again, um, this just explicit advertising for living not only near Lee's statue and later other statues, um, but the idea that it will bring you cultural and economic value to move in this area. So the cultural and economic drive to build and live on the street reinforced certain ideas and hopes white elite Richmonders had of themselves and the success of the South as a whole after the Civil War and after the Reconstruction era. Through putting these sources in conversation with my map of the avenue's buildings over time, I hope my exhibit provides another historic and spatial lens for the public to further understand one of the major hubs of racial protest and reckoning that happened in the US over the summer of 2020. And I finally would like to close by saying this project, um, my specific one, but also Janine and I's greater project um, is still a work in progress and something that we both hope to continue building from and improving on. In particular, my exhibit struggles to rewrite and reframe the prose to engage a more public non-academic audience. Um, Ginny and I also both hope for the collective site Divided Union to be marketed and disseminated to reach a wider audience in general. 
um, but also a public non-specialist audience who are interested in learning more about these histories. We both also face ethical and met methodological issues of telling controversial and emotional history histories, which is something we navigate more generally as historians of race and gender, but this issue remains in the project definitely, um, particularly through the issue of balancing um, not wanting to alienate potential people who don't know this history and could benefit from learning this history, um, while also still telling hard historical truths about the continuation of white supremacy. There is also the issue of replicating and reproducing traumatic images of the Confederate flag or other kind of memorabilia around that time period. And finally, there is also the issue of our own personal time and, and resources, which is another common problem most academics face of investing uncompensated labor and time into a side project that's not under an official entity. Though these methodological and ethical issues persist, we are driven by the pedagogical potential this project still holds in narrating and visualizing the historic origins of specific names and statues that were contested last summer with the agenda of extending this important work of racial reckoning. So thank you, and I will turn it over to Janine. Thanks, Laura. And let me just go ahead and share my screen. Okay, great. So as Laura mentioned, I concentrated um, more on Grant. Well, first of all, I had trouble focusing this project because um, this history has so many layers and political movements and contention um, that uh, I had a hard time kind of uh, pinpointing what I want to focus on, but I get I kept getting pulled back to Grant. Um, you know, when his statue was toppled on June 2020 in San Francisco, I asked why Grant, you know, why the leader of the Union Army who defeated the Confederates, you know, president of the United States. And at the time, I didn't realize his connections to slavery. So I felt like he offered a really great way um, to kind of uh, pull out the complexities of some of these issues um, and connections, uh, con connecting kind of the political back then to the now, um, what I felt was a good way to do this. So my talk um, has three parts. Maybe I'm still having trouble focusing on this project, but uh, the first talk, uh, first part, we'll talk about slavery and the American presidents and Grant's complicity in slavery and later efforts towards equality. Um, the second will be Confederate based names during World War II and how that ties into current issues. And then three, I'm just going to share uh, two maps um, how, of how Confederate symbols are um, displayed globally that I'm kind of playing with right now. So I'm gonna start a little bit before with Washington and Jefferson, um, two of our most famous enslaver presidents um, to see how they viewed slavery kind of in relation to Grant. So both Washington and, Washington and Jefferson owned hundreds of slaves between them and actively took part in the slave market. Both questioned the morality of slavery. Washington did not approach the subject publicly as he thought it would divide the new country. And Jefferson preferred a gradual reduction of slaving activities, but also saw it as a divisive issue that would tear the country apart. Neither were, were wrong. While Washington freed his slaves, Jefferson did not and often slowed, sold his enslaved people to pay for his own debts. And he did not free the majority of slaves upon his death. And as we know, he fathered many children born to enslaved women, Sally Hemings. As leaders of the nation, each had an opportunity to confront the slave issue, but they chose not to. Ulysses S. Grant was born in 1822 to an abolitionist family, but broke with his family on the slavery issue. He married, he married Julia Dent, who hailed from an enslaver family. Julia's enslaved servants lived with the Grants and traveled around the country in military camps as Julia followed her husband. There's Grant uh, in uniform. So Grant left the military after the U.S.-Mexican-American uh, War and lived on the Dent's farm. Once Julia's father became ill, Grant ran the farm, which included supervising enslaved people. We do not know much about his relationship to the slave, slaves on the Dent's farm or in his own household, but we do know he enslaved one man, William Jones, who he emancipated before the Civil War. 
And this is a picture of um, uh, the enslaved property on the, on the Grant family farm. Grant entered the Civil War ambivalent about slavery, which drew the attention of others serving in the Union Army. Julia again followed Grant during the war and took her enslaved woman Jules along. Many in the camp called her a secesh wife, meaning one who was sympathetic toward the South secession, secession from America. But Grant was serving in an army did, that did not have concrete views of slavery from the civilian leadership. And other Union officers did not support emancipation. Lincoln himself initially thought it was best to relocate slaves of African descent out of the country as a way to deal with the slave problem. When Lincoln signed, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, he did not do so based on moral values. Lincoln proclaimed that he would keep slavery if it would cause the Confederate States to rejoin America, but would get rid of slavery if it would save the Union. When it became obvious that the Confederate States would not rejoin the Union, Lincoln emancipated slaves. While it would be unfair to say that Lincoln's actions were not made without questioning the morality of slavery, it would be inaccurate to say Lincoln freed slaves purely for moral reasons. At this point, Grant has no choice but to support emancipation and military activities. As for Jules, the Grant's enslaved woman, she finally leaves the family of her own will. Once Grant becomes president, he worked to pass the 15th Amendment, which made it unlawful to deny the right to vote based on race. This was particularly important during the Reconstruction years as Black Americans were exercising their newfound freedoms in the South and building political power, despite efforts of some white Southerners to deny Black Americans rights. Grant also suggested acquiring Santo Domingo as a place for Black Americans to live freely but connected to the United States to avoid the violent conflict aimed at Black Americans, namely through the Ku Klux Klan. This has tones of past president suggestions um, of relocating Black Americans out of America or deporting them, depending on the president. But Frederick Douglass also worked on the Santa Domingo Commission. It never passed legislature. Grant uh, did use federal military power to squash KKK violence in North Carolina until, of course, the KKK arose again decades later during uh, the Jim Crow years. Up to this point in history, Grant did more uh, than any other president to try to make um, a more equal society for Black Americans. However, he remains a complex figure due to his connections to slavery, the Western Indian Wars, and expulsions of Jewish people. In the election of 1876, Grant leaves office and there is a big controversy surrounding the, the uh, 1876 election and who was really elected president. If this sounds familiar to anyone, the nation did not know who won the presidency for weeks and accu accusations of voter fraud was widespread. Finally, Rutherby Hayes is called the victor and while he supports reconstruction, the South grew too politically powerful during this period and white leaders and citizens simply got bored of pushing forward with racial reckoning and equality. The end of reconstruction allowed for white supremacy to gain a foothold in the South again, for Jim Crow laws and violent, violence against black Americans to arise for the lost con narrative, one that saw the South as a preserver of state rights who fought valiantly in the Civil War and ignored the racist values of slavery to be celebrated. So we see Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, Grant, and Hayes all having opportunities to create a more equal society, but the nation and the leaders would only go so far before slowing their efforts. We see this again after World War I, World War II, and the civil rights movements of the 1960s. We are at this point again in American history where we need to see what the Biden administration does, how far they are going to push for equality, and how committed the American people will remain to these efforts. With the protests of 2020, we see racial reckoning on multiple levels. Confederate and enslaver statues are toppled, names of prominent institutions are changing due to the racist nature of their namesakes and calls for changes in policing policies. Um, are being called for. At the heart of a lot of this is the military, which is now being pushed to recognize its use of Confederate symbols. Before the summer protests in 2020, the Marines and the Navy banned the use of Confederate flags at its installations. In the summer of 2020, Army bases with Confederate 
flags came under attack. Calls to change the bases have increased in the last five years after the tra tragic events in Charlottesville and South Carolina, which linked the symbols of the Confederacy to white supremacy, but the Army claimed that the naming of the bases was not a political one. They were made to honor military expertise and took a tone of reconciliation, which to many sounded like when America turned away from reconstruction efforts after the Civil War that focused on building a more free society in the South to one of sectional reconciliation. This caused the North to accept the reign of white supremacy in the South. In 2017, the Pentagon also said that the renaming of the bases would be too divisive. Again, this line of thinking supports white supremacist thinking instead of taking into consideration people of color. This was only in 2017. As I was researching um, base names, I came upon a blog post from the US Army Center for Military History titled Naming of US Army Posts. This CMH post provides a good overview of how posts in the World War I and World War II era were named. Since archives are closed at this time, the CMH kindly attached primary sources to the post, which I was able um, to look at and conduct my own research. So while my research is limited on this topic due to COVID, um, uh, I did um, kind of go through these documents and found some interesting facts. So due to the massive buildup of the military in both world wars, uh, a large amount of military camps were built to train and deploy soldiers. In World War I, there are four camps um, were given Confederate names. Um, and then in World War II, we have um, eight camps that were given Confederate names. And this is all on our website, um, if you guys want to look at it more closely later. It should be noted that during this time, Black Americans served in the military, but they served in segregated units in both wars, and their opportunity to serve in combat units was limited. Many of these Black service members spent time on bases with Confederate names. So during World War II, uh, a document by the Army making suggestions for post names offers a note about the naming bases in the South. Oops. Sorry, that was supposed to be bigger for you guys to see. Um, it reads, many appropriate names connected with the history of Georgia are already in use. General Benjamin Lincoln was a very distinguished Revolutionary War officer, but because of its connotation to the people in that section of the country, the use of the name Lincoln is considered inadvisable. Even though the Civil War ended in 1865, nearly 75 years before this report, the South identified so closely to the Confederacy that the Army warned of naming a base in Georgia with the name Lincoln, as it would cause a local population to possibly protest and not support the military locally. While the military is looking for support of the wars from the general public, the conversation shows that the military is more concerned about white citizens and soldiers and not the black citizens and soldiers in the region. One example of a time the Army did consider Black soldiers was a naming an embarkment center for Black soldiers near Seattle, Washington. Several suggestions were made for naming the center after heroic Black soldiers, but all were dismissed, and it was suggested that renowned Black scholar George Washington Carver be the namesake for the camp. While no doubt Carver offered much pride within the Black community, by choosing a civilian over a military veteran denied Black soldiers to connect the past heroic service by other Black men with theirs. At a time when the military represented masculinity and citizenship, many Black people used the military as a way towards full citizenship and equality. The officer in charge at the base persisted in asking for the camp to have a military name after a Black service member and the Army approved. They called the center Camp George Jordan after an ex-slave who spent over 30 years in the military and received the Medal of Honor uh, for his participation in the Buffalo Wars. So many, milita many military leaders are now acknowledging the need uh, to change the name of Confederate bases and the military and government are looking to change the base names within the next three years. Retired General David Petraeus wrote an article in The Atlantic on June 9, 2020, relating his own personal journey and realizing the significance of these base names and why they should be changed. Petraeus said that this is a war on memory, 
and we have the ability to change the narrative in the nation as one towards inclusion and in a way from exclusion. Joint Chiefs of Staff um, Chairman Mark Milley did say that Confederate flags, another Confederate symbol used by some military members, could affect unit cohesion and effectiveness as over 40% of the army are people of color. Units often make up 20 to 30% of African Americans and serving on a base with a Confederate name might mean that they are serving on a base named for someone who could have enslaved their ancestors. Millie also acknowledged that the naming of bases were political uh, decisions, quote, 100 years ago, and they are going to be political decisions today. So just in about, you know, the last three to five years, we see that the narrative of, of the Pentagon seems to be changing. Another reason this matters is many participants in the events at uh, the US Capitol insurrection on January 6th are mili uh, active military or veterans. This event included people wearing and carrying many symbols of hate groups and uh, Confederate flags. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, first African-American person to hold this position, issued a military-wide stand down to address extremism in the ranks as nearly one in five people charged in connection with the riot have some form of military background. The military has a right to be concerned about racist symbols in the military, and so do American citizens. So I wanted to show you um, kind of two maps of I've kind of been creating. When you, we were looking closely at the Southern Poverty Law, um, Law, I'm sorry, Southern Poverty Center map of Confederate symbols. And it's such a great map and it shows everything in the United States. But I'm, I started thinking, well, what about globally? What's going on with Confederate symbols globally? So they, this is just a, a small example of, of where you can find Confederate symbols globally. But there tends to be um, three reasons why this happens, um, including, according to Mark uh, Pitkovich, who is a senior research fellow at the Anti-Defamation League Center on Extremism. He says there's people who are just kind of like, you know, don't really know what it means, thinks it's kind of cool and don't really understand the political undertones behind it. There are people who um, relate to kind of the political message of the lost narrative of, you know, a conquered people who fought valiantly and, and have some sort of, you know, state rights or rights of their own that were violated. And then we have the more extreme ones um, who are, um, white supremacists and, and racists. So some of these areas that are uh, kind of of interest is um, here in Cork, Ireland, uh, there's a soccer team called the Rebels. Um, so there's calls now for the Confederate flag not to be flown um, because people are starting to recognize the meaning behind that. Uh, Brazil is an interesting place because 10,000 US Confederates left after the Civil War and emigrated to Brazil. And yearly, they celebrate something called the Festa Confederada. Uh, I kind of butchered that Spanish name, but that's okay. Um, so they, they celebrate their past heritage by dancing, eating Southern food. And as you can see, they're dancing on a Confederate uh, floor and have Confederate flags flowing. A lot of people say there's no politics behind this. This is just our heritage. But other people are saying, you know, again, we need to look at what these mean and um, stop using them. Then you have more you know, concerning kind of issues. So here in Poland, uh, Trump, President Trump held a rally in July 2016 where a lot of um, right-wing uh, political activists showed up in Poland waving Confederate flags. So here we see a direct connection between the Confederate flags and America and a president who kind of supports the use of them. And then, you know, even more disturbing, of course, is kind of neo-Nazis in Germany um, who carry white supremacist flags and, and march in the street using Confederate flags, as you can see in this video here. I read an article in The Atlantic by um, Dr. Matthew Delmont. Uh, he's up at um, Dartmouth College. And he was mapping, he was, uh, not mapping, but he was showing Confederate symbols during World War II around the world. So if I just pull it out a second, you can see that there's, you know, m many here in Europe. Um, there's uh, some here in um, 
Japan, Okinawa, and on the Solomon Islands. So what would happen is that Southern soldiers would bring Confederate flags and when they won a battle, they would fly the flag. In some cases, um, the officers told them to take down the flag. In other cases, they didn't, they celebrated, it. they were officers themselves. But there's a couple, there are two that are kind of interesting. First is this one in France where a Kentucky soldier after the war asked his parents to send a Confederate flag because he wanted to hang it in a French school so he can influence the teaching of the war between the states. So here we see a direct relation between the US military and trying to influence how um, the United States history is viewed in other parts of the country that most likely denies kind of these racist past. And the other one that caught my attention was um, here in Naples, uh, a US Fifth Army uh, major from Richmond, Virginia, um, flew a flag over the town because he said, this is one war we're going to win. And I find this interesting because here in Naples, Italy, currently, um, people fly Confederate flags because they connect with their own kind of position as a defeated people uh, when the North Italians conquered them in 1861 and they felt that they lived in a very rich and pros prosperous uh, kind of community and once they took over their money went to Rome and they lost a lot of their wealth. So they kind of connect in their own sense their own lost heritage to the Confederate um, narrative of you know um, states rights having to give up what they believed in. But I can't help but wonder how long they kind of knew about the Confederacy or if the military directly influenced their connections with this. I'm not an Italian um, scholar, so I can't um, talk about that much. But, you know, these are just ways that I think um, you can use digital history to figure out um, different connections between history in the past and now and, and what we possibly need to pay attention to. So that's it for our, I guess, long talks. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions anyone might have. Any questions? Kelly? So, why why did you ever find out why um in san francisco they tore down the like did you find out why they turned down turned down um grant's uh, monument in san francisco you know i think it's just his connection to slavery um you know and i think that did was it say? Kind of, what's that did they say i would just i'm just trying no, to get the question started they did they really say no, but you know, there were other kind of uh, Spanish explorers or um, mm -hmm. who were kind of torn down at that time who have links to, you know, genocide yeah. and slavery. Um, you know, and I think that was one of the things we talked about this project is um, the levels of guilt, right? Like, you know, you have someone like Jefferson who owned hundreds of slaves, routinely sold them in and out, you know, um, had children with an enslaved woman, but kept her enslaved her whole life, um, sold those slaves for his own debt. And then you have people like Grant who, you know, actively took part in slavery and owned a slave. How do you, you know, how, how do you kind of deal with these notions of people in different levels of guilt, you know? So that's a question I, I think that's really interesting because there's so much division between we have to get rid of all these people and know you're erasing culture. So, so kind of what is that, that in between? So for, for Grant, it was, you know, that was it. And I'm not saying it's, it's right or wrong, you know, because he, he, he has guilt for that. Like I said, the Indian wars, he expelled Jews. He spent a lot of his life trying to kind of fix these things that he did, but you know, it wasn't like he became a modern version of what we would consider anti-racist. Thanks, Janine. Um, I just wanted to acknowledge um, some questions in the comments and just put out to folks if you have questions to you can either enter it into the chat or you can raise your hand and you can raise your hand by um, on the bottom of the zoom window there's a reactions button and if you click on that there's an option to raise your hand. Um, so either entering your question directly into the chat 
or raising your hand um, and we'll call on folks in order. Um, but there's a question in the chat about, um, as the first person commented about something you touched on Janine around um, the relationship between grant and indigenous people. Um, and then there was a question yeah, I... about, um, can you talk to the process? Can you talk about the process of making the maps, especially the Monument Avenue map? So I'll take a quick second to talk about Grant. Grant has a very complicated relationship with, with native peoples. Um, he had one of the first native people to, you know, sit highly in, within his um, uh, kind of, uh, it, he wasn't in his cabinet, but, you know, he helped with, with a lot of um, kind of native policies and, and things of that sort. Um, you know, but Grant was an assimilationist. So he believed that assimilation should be done as kindly as possible. But at the same time, you know, his signature is on a lot of these kind of atrocities that were in the Indian Wars. So, um, you know, personally, I think he has a lot of, a lot of blame in that. Um, so, so you're absolutely, absolutely right. And, and that could have been one of the reasons why he was torn down at, at, uh, in San Francisco too. So thank you for reminding me of, of that reason, even though I mentioned it. But Laura um, has a lot to say about the monument path map. Thanks, Janine. Um, yeah, and thank you, Jason, for the question. Um, yeah, so making maps in, in general digitally, you need to make sure that there's some sort of, you need a geocode, whatever text you have. Um, so basically meaning if you have an address or latitude and longitude coordinates um, or something from some data set you can pull, you need to geocode or basically tell the computer you know, this is the region I'm working in of Virginia in the US and I want this specific address um, in Richmond to be associated with this point or this line or marker or, or whatever it is. And so um, that was the general um, kind of method I used and I was lucky to use Story Maps ArcGIS, which I recommend. Um, through George Mason, our university, we have um, like free access to it essentially. So you do need to have some sort of institutional access. So I think it should be fairly affordable to the public. Um, but yeah, so that data set I shared kind of had that, um, it had the address I wanted to geocode and then associated, associated data with that address that then I used to manipulate um, the data. So the colored points are associated by the year that they were built. Um, and for story maps, it was a pretty um, fairly straightforward system of me um, just uploading my CSV file of the that data set into story maps. And then from there, it kind of is like a user friendly way to say, you know, change the color based on the year column. And then that's, that's kind of what resulted with my map. Um, Janine and I both used the programming language R, which I referenced. So because for my data set, I had the data from one place of the houses and then data from another place with the Confederate statues. And so I need to put them on top of each other like you saw. And so um, that data, as Janine and I mentioned, is from the Southern Poverty Law Center's project, Whose Heritage, which is a, a great, fabulous map of the different Confederate statues and it tracks like which ones have been removed and which ones haven't been and so forth. Um, but I used R as a programming language just to filter down that data set, which is from all the US just to the ones in Richmond. Um, but yeah, and I know Janine also her maps are great and she used story maps, which is, um, you know, she used I think a different setting to make it that more narrative format. Um, so there's a lot of different options, but that was the route I took. I can read out the two questions that were just entered in the chat too. And um, so the first one is from Diana, um, who asks, how do you interpret the impact of digital history in the public? And how are you disseminating your project in the public? Um, and then the next question, I'm just going to pass them both to y'all, um, is from Jillian, who asks, uh, hello, um, do you have any comments on the semantic ecotone surrounding the Confederate monuments and museums? that are popular tourist destinations. Do you want to talk about that, Laura? 
Um, sure, but do you want to answer first the first question? I can build off of that. Yeah, either way. So, I mean, we think digital history is huge if you can reach the audience, right? Um, because especially during COVID, museums aren't open, people aren't um, getting out to as many sites, but they're, they're also at home reading a lot more. Um, I think the real kind of difficulty is you're, I think in digital history, in a lot of ways you're preaching to the choir because people will come to your website because they're interested and not necessarily that um, uh, they're gonna agree with everything you say, um, but there's always that if they're not agreeing with you, are they gonna click off of your website? Um, so we we're just hoping to kind of, there were, at the time, there were just so, there was so much information going on. And we were like, well, how can we like kind of more easily contextualize this for people um, to, to get a broader uh, understanding of the connections? Because as we were reading through this, I mean, I'm a 20th century historian. So really reading through all this material, I was like, well, like, I mean, I don't know, we might as well just be living back then now because these arguments are the same. Um, so I think it's really important for people to know about that. And um, uh, uh, I'm not really sure how we're going to get this project out to the public. We, that's something we haven't really talked about, but, um, and we haven't really talked about it much yet because there's still a lot of work that we kind of want to do on that. But talking to you guys is one helpful way. <laughs> yeah, and just, yeah, building off of that, um, we've talked about before how just because something's digital doesn't mean it's public necessarily. So that piece of dissemination um, is really important and something like Janine said, we're still trying to work through since this project is more so in its earlier phases. Um, we haven't gotten to dissemination, but we definitely want to. Um, and I think it's just from my experience in other digital history projects, it's just um, like specific targeted audiences, not targeted in a bad way, but just, you know, like thinking through what kind of person do we want to come to this website and then like backpedaling to um, do you pursue different channels, whether it's social media or, you know, different community groups or, or whatever it is to kind of make sure we get our, our work out in, in front of the eyes of those sort of people. So um, that's kind of the general plan. Um, but yeah, we definitely would love more thoughts on that. And I can start by answering Jillian's question and then Janine, feel free to jump in as well. Um, but yeah, the, the practice of Confederate monuments in museums as popular tourist destinations um, is, yeah, definitely an, an interesting but troubling issue. And I think, um, you know, there's, there is a lot of push, I mean, and just thinking in the context of last summer of people um, and protesters removing the statues, whether by force or, you know, um, local community leaders removing them. Um, you know, there's always a question, I, or I think sometimes the question isn't asked once they're removed of where do they go? And then, you know, what is like the life history of that statue if there is one at all? And so um, it's, I think that this has actually been a question too that has been discussed in, in Europe kind of more so just since they have uh, such a colored past with different monuments and memory as well. Um, and, you know, there's different sides to the debate of, you know, putting them in a museum for preservation sake versus just like um, disseminating them versus, um, just like getting rid of them for good, however that looks like ecologically. So I think um, there, there's a lot of points to it. And I will say that from the historian's pers perspective, like preservation is um, always helpful, at least to know then the past of where we've come from and like what, you know, being able to document at least I think the removal and the protests of those items are where I focus my study and um, what I think is important in that scope. So that's sort of where I come from it. And, and just um, as a historian too, I'm interested in people's like perceptions of those monuments at the time. And so there's a lot of history in Richmond actually of um, the, the black communities like initial responses when these statues were put up. And I think those are histories that are also very worth being told. Um, I'm not sure if you have anything, any other thoughts, Janine, that you wanna add? Well, I do, you know, I think 
uh, just like um, the Freeman statue here in DC. You know, so it's not just these Confederate statues. It's like, you know, Lincoln as the emancipator and the enslaved man is on his knees. And, you know, back in the 1800s, um, you know, Douglas was like, I don't want to see a statue of a man on his knees, but it's still there. You know, we're not seeing kind of different statues um, kind of emerging. So I think it's not just these Confederate statues, but it's all these statues that really make you look and question like, why are we seeing this person here? Because clearly, you know, this isn't what a, a, an enslaved person was. Um, you know, and there's there are indigenous statues up in um, New England. There's one of, of a woman, you know, she's holding scalps in her hand, like a, of, of a woman who was during King Philip's war who escaped um, native people. And it, it's just a very bloody and brutal kind of concept and statue. And, you know, do these things really kind of need to be there? Um, and there's a lot of smart people looking into that right now, which is, you know, great. Um, but I think there's something kind of connected to this. Oh, someone was asking us, uh, Sean, I'm sorry, you were asking, you know, our thoughts on, you know, how, how do you deal with people who kind of have these complex histories, you know, who kind of do bad things and then kind of, uh, but also have, have good things that happen. And, you know, I think um, naming, renaming, you know, institutions with presidential names who are just simply racist like Wilson. You know, it's like, okay, yeah, okay, he led us through World War One and, you know, set up the League of Nation, whatever. I'm sure he did a bunch of other stuff, but people are saying, no, that's, that's enough. You know, we don't want to be associated with that name. Laura Ingalls Wilder, you know, kind of talked about um, uh, indigenous people in a way that, that was not kind of appropriate to now. So, you know, I, I don't, I personally don't have a problem with taking these names off, but, you know, you do need to give the good with the bad and things I do I do think. I don't know if Laura has thoughts on that. Yeah, no, I I absolutely agree with Janine um, that I think I personally don't mind them being removed, but I think I think a full contextualization is really important. Um, just even even beyond like what the outcome is of it's if it's removed, if it's changed, if it's not, whatever it is, I think it's still really important just moving forward to have have that contextualization there of both the you know when it was placed and who who like was affected by it but also the prehistory of like who fundraised for it and was adamantly wanting it to be there um because those people have um it's just really important to remember i think moving forward i think we have I think that we kind of answered um kim brannon's question but if you want to address that one more you can um, we have um one more question and that just came up in the chat and it looks like someone just raised their hand i'm wondering if folks are okay with maybe going an extra five to ten minutes this feels like a really rich conversation that i don't want to cut short but i also want to honor people's time is it okay if we maybe extend the q a for another 10 minutes and then wrap up at 4 10. can we um also can we call on uh dr spencer crew who would like to comment <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Crew. Oh, we can't hear oh, there you. There we go, good. Um, hello, Laura, hello, Janine. Um, as you create your, your mapping, how are you gonna fold in the voices of those who are from the affected communities? Because I know in your work, you, you include them in, but I'm not sure I see them in your, in your webpage to date. Yeah, that's a great question. I, I can start. Um, I, some, there's it's part of the link um, and it's actually there's some on the page um, before the page with my map um, it has the uh, screenshot or the image of the a newspaper article written by John Mitchell Jr. Um, that was in direct protest to the, um, the, the original Lee statue being put up so that, that it is included on the website um, but not right alongside the map and that is still an important question that I want to continue thinking through. Um, Janine and I have talked about just with digital methods, it would be really cool to do some kind of text analysis of, you know, looking about calling all the different articles, even just Mitchell wrote in like Thomas Fortune since they were adamant um, 
about criticizing the Lee statue being put up. Um, but that is definitely like methodologically um, and time-wise a, a bigger um, bite to chew off than where we can do right now. But um, definitely, yeah, reasserting the voices of those affected um, is really important to me. So thank you for bringing that up. I think with the um, World War One, the World War Two Global Project, um, I think uh, I, I'm going to contact that uh, that scholar who's working on that project because I think that's a really easy way because you do have active voices among Black soldiers within Europe, kind of calling this out, and I think that would you know that's a really good way to kind of contextualize what's happening. Um, kind of the voices that are being called out. And as you know, you know, it's such a complex um, um, time for um, civil rights uh, during World War II. Um, so I think that's a great project to be able to kind of work. Uh, we hear a lot about what soldiers were saying during World War II, or at least that's what I've concentrated a lot in America. And I think this is a, a really good way to bring the black voice out um, over in Europe. As far as the global map, um, you know, I haven't thought too far on that one. Neither of those are published publicly. They're just kind of private ones for me right now to look at. Um, but that one's a lot more complex that, you know, given, I don't know if that would ever be public because given my lack of Italian and Portuguese. And <laughs> or maybe I could bring other scholars on, calling all Haystack scholars who know Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you know, I, I, I think in Laura and I struggled with this project, you know, in that sense, because we felt like, are we just telling another white man's history right now? Thanks. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I just want to read off Kristen's question slash comment, which is, in many parts of the country, the chief problematic monuments are not solely those of the Confederacy. For instance, early colonial discoverers and pioneer monuments in the Northwest may sidestep slavery and the Confederacy, but are equally egregious with respect to indigenous people. The whose heritage question is still pertinent. Um, how we reckon um, the Confederate monuments that serve as models for interrogating um, and especially removing other sorts of monuments um, is a question. And then, um, yeah, actually let me leave that question first and mute myself. Well, I think I, you know, we kind of talked about this um, a few minutes ago a bit um, about kind of the savagery of some of these statues. Certainly um, in New Mexico, um, Oñate is, was being taken down. I, I actually, I sent this to Laura when, when the statue was first put up, he's famous for cutting off um, people's hands, um, indigenous hands. He was just a brutal person. Um, so once the statue was kind of put up, um, people went off and cut off his hands. So I think that there's been, this has been longer than just 2020, you know, I mean, this has been um, a century or even longer that people have contested these statues. So I agree with you completely. We had talked about including, um, we done, we did a lot of research on kind of Columbus um, uh, statues being torn down, but, but we just, you know, we had to limit our project and this is what what we chose to limit it on. Yeah, I was just gonna echo Janine. I had almost actually done a, a comparison with my project with just the Lee statue in Richmond and the Christopher Columbus statue in Richmond because that um, Columbus statue was also protested um, recently in Richmond as well. And yeah, just like Janine said, for, for scope and a, and a manageable um, kind of set of sources and, and time-wise, we had to focus it in some way, but I do think it's a great point, and definitely um, to your specific question, I, I do think like this kind of toolbox of questions that you ask about a certain monument, um, a certain confederate monument can be applied right to any monument or any kind of like memory related item of where is this from, like when was this placed, who fundraised for it, who built it, who was affected by it, who has been walking by it every day on their way to work, you know, um, who who has been protesting since day one um, to remove it, you know, all of those questions can be applied to anyone um, in any monument. And I, I think though, yeah, indigenous related monuments, um, especially Columbus, like a lot of Columbus statues were protested this past summer as well. Um, and just a point on that too, um, I wanted to note 
that Confederate statues in, in particular are also not just limited to the South by any means, that kind of lost cause era I was talking about. There's still some that are Confederate statues in, in the West, in the Northwest and in the North. And so, yeah, it's a great point though, to make sure we're not limiting ourselves or creating a narrative about just one thing because it's it's more complex than that. Yeah, and um, you know, I, right, my, my big thing is we have to give the people who are affected by these agency. So, you know, how, how are the people who are affected feeling by it? And I think those kind of feelings and thoughts are the ones that need to be leading our decisions. In the comments, Jason, thanks you all for a great talk um, and shares an article on George Floyd Square um, and a local community effort to memorialize and build a place based on memory. Um, also in the comments, someone, um, Susan shared um, in New York that we have our own contested monuments such as the Teddy Roosevelt statue in front of the American and Natural History. Um, and Jillian, thanks you all for a great presentation um, and sends greetings from San Jose, California. Um, yeah, so thank you all for a great presentation. Is there, do you have any closing thoughts um, or ways that people can maybe stay in contact with you and your work? Oh, sure. Well, we, we had put our website um, up above, but we can also put in our, mm -hmm. our emails here as well. Yeah, and feel free to um, follow me on Twitter. I can put my handle in here and my email, but yeah, um, really just, yeah, staying in touch via Twitter and um, just, yeah, feel free to look at our website in more detail and, you know, give us any feedback or any comments would be great. Yeah, and I think just having these important conversations with your friends and family members and just constantly bringing back to them the historical context so they can understand the kind of um, complexities of all this and, and why it's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you so much, Janine and Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it.